So my name is Michael Keller. I'm the university librarian. I'm, I'm here to introduce Denise Gigante and to um, begin this book launch for her brand new book, one of several that she's already published and a couple more to come that look even as exciting as this one. Uh, but before I do that, I need to uh, make a few confessions. And one of my confessions is that I have a mild variant of the bibliophilia that appears and is described. <laughs> and that mild uh, bibliophilia is not only personal, it's also professional and even corporate. So I am crazy for books, and I am inundated by my own collection. And if you had any idea of the size of this collection, the one that the 37 curators and the 400 and some odd other staff that take care of the books and other library materials in this collection, you would completely understand how we swim, metaphorically at least, in an amazing pool of wonderful books, many of them quite interesting, as Elaine Traharn's and Ben Albritton's exhibit on books in, downstairs in the, um, in the uh, gallery, the exhibit gallery. Um, Making books, what's the title again? The Handmade, the handmade Book. That's M-A-D-E, yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, as, as, before I begin uh, my very short remarks, uh, I'd like you to understand that it's possible for you to visit that little book stand over there, which has only one title for sale, but they have lots of copies. <laughs> and I encourage you to uh, add this book, add this book to your own collection. The, uh, it's, uh, the, the way we've uh, um, described this evening, we thought we might wait to eat later, but I don't want to keep anybody from eating. So if you feel like you need to have a bite or, no, 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 no apologies. That food is there for you to eat. That wine and those, uh, the lemonade and the water is for you to drink. Just go up quietly and get it. Okay. So, Denise, gigante has been a professor here since 2000. The year she graduated with her PhD from Princeton, having been at Princeton for an MA and having graduated in 87 from Yale with a BA. What college were you in, Denise? That detail is not here. At Yale? Yeah. Okay, I was there in Pearson, but I wasn't a student, alas. Yeah, you too? We should talk. Okay, so um, Denise is the Sadie Durnham Patek Professor of Humanities. From the moment she arrived until then, she's been an assistant professor for a few years, an associate professor very shortly, and then promoted to full professor in 2011. Uh, she, uh, in my opinion, uh, she is a marvelous scholar, marvelous teacher, but she is um, a very aggressive and active scholar and I have her CV in front of me, and it's filled with titles I'd love to read to you, but I'm not gonna take more than a few minutes to, to introduce her and uh, get this started. I will uh, tease you a bit. Her next two books, this is Book Madness, right? A story of book collectors in America. The next two books are, forthcoming from Oxford, The Mental Traveler, a Blakean Pilgrimage through medieval and Renaissance iconography. Wow. And um, another one, which is, uh, a, a looks like an anthology to me, is the Cambridge History of the British Essay with Jason Childs, published eventually by Cambridge University Press. 2024. 2024, so close. Amazing. Um, she has uh, written uh, essays, a book, uh, made presentations on Keats. She is interested in gastronomy in various ages and in various stages, quite marvelously. It doesn't look like she eats a whole lot, <laughs> but she may consume it very rapidly because she's such a busy, busy scholar in some interesting places. Um, she has uh, famously uh, um, uh, regarded highly as a teacher. Uh, her uh, courses uh, just make me want to get a whole lot younger in a hurry. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this one, Denise. Where is it? Transgressions in Taste. 
Libraries ornamental, gastronomical, and bibliomaniacal. Manical. Mania. Maniacal. How do I say that? Bibliomaniacal. There you go. Uh, amazing. These are just one uh, after another, very, very uh, uh, topics that draw one in. And uh, I'm not going to have time to read all of them, but I'm going to try to read some of them. This evening, she'll be joined by Professor Emeritus Peter Stansky, Professor Gavin Wright, John Wendell, bookseller extraordinaire, to talk about this bibliomania, to talk about this madness. And I think uh, with that, I want to turn this over to you, Denise, to carry forth. Thanks for letting us have this book launch with you and all of your friends. I don't have a talk, I have the run of show for this evening, so. Um, I just really wanted everybody to know uh, that I'm really grateful that everybody made it out. I know everybody's busy. Um, you know, working in the humanities uh, can often, or at least it has the reputation of being lonely for those who produce research and, and publish books. but. Books, as I learned uh, in writing this book, are also sources of profound connection in many ways. Um, so of course, you've all had the childhood experience of connecting with fictional characters, with ideas, with beautiful lines of poetry. Um, I had the pleasure in this book of connecting to a whole range of bibliophiles and bibliomaniacs, mainly bibliophiles in America. Well, no, I would say they were mostly bibliomaniacs. <laughs> um, the difference being that bibliomania was defined as a pathologized version of bibliophilia. Um, so, uh, the, so the characters in the book, because I've, I've mapped out what I, I, I tried to show can be a, a path for literary studies, um, that draws in um, the methodologies of uh, bibliography, biography, uh, narrative to some extent, and of course literary analysis, and mixes them together. And really what, what it hinges on, again, is connections between books, people, events, and other things. The characters in my book were my greatest joy, I think, because they, you know, life isn't perfect and things can look pretty bleak sometimes, but, you know, just being able to spend time with these people from the mid 19th century whose genuine passion was in literature and books uh, was so nourishing. These, these people are very, very, uh, genuine, committed people who were amateurs. They weren't book professionals. They were book lovers who had to take a job in order to pay the rent, so to speak. Uh, but then the, their life really happened around books outside of that. Um, so whether they worked in a counting house or at, in, a, in a law firm or, or on the docks, uh, Really, they were connected to books and to each other through books. And that, I would say, is even probably the greater emphasis in my book, how books can bring people together, how connections that form between people can result in all sorts of phenomena, including societies, clubs, um, uh, publications, uh, events, celebrations, memorials, monuments, um, testimonials, all sorts of things bring people together. And this is an opportunity to come together, so I really do appreciate that. I just want to say one word about in like a snapshot of how the what the book is and, and how it began, and then I, I'll just turn it over for comments to my colleagues. So <clears throat> The, the library of Charles Lamb, who was a British essayist, very beloved in America in the mid-19th century, uh, was uh, mythic. It was legendary because Lamb wrote about it in his essays. 
and he modeled a kind of engagement with his books that was very lively, right? So between borrowing, getting back books from Coleridge that were all marked up, dribbling cheese into his own books, uh, you know, uh, back and forth, letters, uh, correspondence, uh, very, very convivial uh, group of people oriented around books. That library uh, was shipped to America in 1848, 60 volumes of it that remained. And this was sensational because everybody wanted to get their hands on those books. And so my book is because, simply because those books were irreplaceable copies. They were not copies that could be swapped out with another version of the book. So, uh, so I've organized the book around different clusters of book collecting and book love and bibliomania in America in the mid-19th century, uh, brought together through the focal point of that sale in New York in 1848. So there was a book sale at a bookstore, and then there was an auction later in the year. And it really ranges as far west as Cincinnati, and really, though, is focused in Boston and New York, which were the book capitals. Boston, New York was the book capital of, of the country at that time, followed by Boston. So that's the organizing principle of the book. The associations that m were made possible through the people who came together around that sale uh, were the seeds for the narrative, um, which really took about 20 years to, <laughs> uh, to, <laughs> to see into print. And the connections that I made in working on the book were crucial with not only excellent research assistants, with colleagues, with librarians, with archivists. I mean, the list of archivists who I could not have done without is massive. Um, so it was, a very, it was the first time I've done a very hev heavily archival book. I wanted to see what that was like, and it really brings you into contact with all sorts of book people. Um, the book began, however, in special collections accidentally in 2001 because I was researching another book and Lamb was in it and I came across this book here uh, which is a copy of w. William Caro Hazlitt's uh, History of the Lambs, Their Lives and Their Correspondence. Um, it was published in 1895 and it's bound together with the Dibding Club of New York's catalog of Charles Lamb's library. And I took a look at it and I realized that it was really quite a phenomenon, a patchwork collection, because in it are handwritten letters from Hazlitt, um, hand typed letters from people like um, Charles Eliot Norton and Robert Clark, who was a Cincinnati book dealer uh, marginalia. It is basically the patchwork collection of a uh, uh, of a bibliomaniac who is tracking down all the copies of Lamb's li uh, books in America, and so that book was like the source of this maniacal, you know, quest that this bibliomaniac was on. And it looks it looked to me like he didn't finish it, so I took it up. And um, you know, it would never have occurred to me to do so. But if you, if if you, if if you're able, I'm not sure. Where's Ben? Are are people able to look at the book, or if you, yeah, um, do it's a very interesting um, product, I think. So okay, so with that in mind, and that's that's just a plug for the serendipity of actually going in and working with original products. You know, very often when we do research online, we're looking for something specific. We're able, because we now have the skills, to go in and find it. Um, but the accidents and the associations that take place when you're browsing a book of shelves or you're working with original materials uh, are, uh, I'm sure many of you know, um, exciting. So, all right. I don't, I'm not going to repeat my distinguished uh, friends' titles, uh, because, you, um, because I don't have them written down here. <laughs> but I want to introduce, I'm here to introduce Gavin Jones, who I'm sure many of you know, um, 
He is a specialist in 19th and 20th century American literature. The humanities at Stanford would simply not be the same without him. He is himself a phenomenon in many ways. Um, John Wendell, uh, an outstanding bookseller from San, antiquarian bookseller from San Francisco, but a scholar in his own right. Uh, and the curator, the, 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 paid, the opener <laughs> of the Blake Gallery in San Francisco, which I advise you're seeing if you haven't seen it. Um, John, you'll have to tell the anecdote at some point about your testimony for the trial of Maurice Sendak's books um, <laughs> and the problem in identifying whether Blake's books were artwork or books. Um, because Sendak left one to his family and the other to his, uh, to his foundation, and there was a big fight after. Um, and then my distinguished colleague, Peter Stansky, professor emeritus in history, uh, whose, whose genuine intellectuality is contagious, um, who is and has been inspirational to more than one generation, of Stanford students and who did not get to celebrate his 90th birthday because of COVID. So I think we should all give him a, a <laughs> celebratory round of applause for that shocking milestone. Who would have guessed? So, okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Denise. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to just reflect for a few minutes on uh, the many accomplishments in Denise's wonderful book from my perspective. That is somebody with uh, limited expertise in 19th century American culture, which is, of course, the subject of uh, this book. When I read it last week, uh, it took me back to my time in graduate school in the early 1990s where Denise and I overlapped for, I don't think we ever really met, but we technically overlapped for a short period of time. And it took me back to my growing awareness at that time of the power of sentimentalism in 19th century American culture and the fraught debate over the sentimental that was still very much uh, in the air. For scholars like Anne Douglas, sentimentalism was bad, it was impotent and conservative, it was a mask for middle class ideologies, it was a rationalization of laissez-faire economics. For other scholars like Jane Tompkins, sentimentalism was good. It was a realm of social power, of salvation through motherly love, an agent of radical transformation toward higher values as religious feeling becomes uh, secular. I always found Tompkins' argument more interesting and attractive. And Denise's book has proven me right through this account of bibliomania, which is also a kind of spin on the complex and powerful role of sentimentalism in the culture of the time, helping us see its significance in new ways. American bibliomania, as Denise describes it, is an effective relationship with books based in a texture of sensory and material associations left in a book by each new reading, which then becomes another kind of association, one of communal belonging and effective relations in which human lives are lived in books and through the networks they create. Denise's idea of the book as relic becomes shorthand for this transference of religious feeling into the secular domain. Like the promise that Tompkins found in the sentimental, this effective relationship with books becomes the condition for sociality, as Denise describes it, and it offers the potential for transformation into higher orders of being. Book madness may perhaps land on one side of this debate over sentimentalism, and I'm glad that it does, though what's more remarkable is how the book breaks down so many categorical distinctions and easy binaries. Take the idea of America itself, the thing that I'm meant to be an expert in. We learn much in book madness about the rise of Americana at mid-century, the desire for a deep, sedimented, accumulated relationship with na national history uh, formed through material associations with books and other artifacts. But here we realize how the fervent nationalism of young America is enabled by much broader transatlantic commerce in books. 
It's fascinating as you read this and come to know the central character of, of Charles Lamb and his uh, uh, various books which, which, which run amok in, uh, in the US. It's interesting to watch a kind of American Charles Lamb take shape through his reception in the US. For somebody like Everett Doikink, one of the key players in this story, Lamb's books come to possess the most American of powers, a manifest destiny to bind the nation together. More binary busting happens at the level of the book's methodology as well. Early on, Denise makes a distinction in literary studies between book history on the one hand and textual interpretation on the other, only to show how intertwined they really are. Through a kind of associative literary history that weaves the content of books into the very fabric of their receptivity to the effects of reading, Book Madness shows how material becomes text for interpretation and how the textual becomes material to be handled and cherished. Or think of that distinction between history and antiquarianism, the former invested in more abstract narratives of events, the latter more interested in moments of material culture found in artifacts, archives, and manuscripts. This study dynamically questions that distinction by giving us the story of antiquarianism as these books like relics dramatically provoke the stuff of narrative. Books create relationships that demand storytelling, and it's a story that's part romance, part adventure. Be prepared for murders and marriages, hauntings and shipwrecks along the way. Indeed, in general, there's so much velocity in this book, fast connections, sudden moments of action as the study moves vertically down on one level into the covers of books, down into those sedimented layers of reading, and then horizontally across time and space to bring books and people into enlightening associations. We might think of yet other binaries too, say that distinction between the individual and the communal. If Benjamin Franklin's idea of self-culture or individual self-improvement through education lies at the heart of the ethos of American book collecting, then we should keep in mind how performance was always key to Franklin's ideas of the self. And if American book auctions were more theatrical in nature than their British counterparts, as Denise demonstrates, then accordingly, book madness is a contribution to performance studies of sorts. In its exquisite awareness of place and space, we encounter the various theatrical stages, whether in bookshops, auctions, or libraries, on which this love of books is performed. Indeed, we can think of the each act of reading uh, that registers itself in an association copy as a kind of performance in itself, one that denies the ephemerality of performance by leaving a mark on or residue within a book with reading thus becoming a reenactment of this drama. Not for nothing is Bardomania, the obsession with the relics of Shakespeare, a major episode in this story in which books as well as other artifacts are very much the actors. I could go on, the point being that this book follows the nose of book collecting and it is a multi-sensory experience in which, which touch and smell are just as, uh, as important as the intellect and the emotion and, uh, and, and sight and, and, and the visual. It's a book that follows the nose of book collecting along an audacious and eclectic trail that troubles easy distinctions. It's a story in which the marginal and marginalia become central and it's one in which we come to realize a truer definition of books and libraries as living powers brought to life by effective human relations. As a final note, if we're interested in Denise's own career, as of course am I, uh, having served on, as Alice Buster remembers, where is Alice? I'm sure I saw her earlier. There she is, as she might remember. I was on the committee that hired Denise. Um, <clears throat> then uh, if we are interested in De Denise's career, uh, then we see how so many of her central interests in romanticism, in biography, in taste, and in life itself come together in this book and are all taken in new directions, all enlivened by that manic intellectual energy that makes this such an exhilarating journey through the literary life. Thank you.
follow that. <laughs> that was brilliant. And you really captured Denise's book. I found her book excellent and enjoyable as the first substantial contribution that I am aware of to the study of American bibliomania. Many years ago, I published the bibliography of Thomas Frognall Dibden, who is sadly, hint, hint, not as well represented in the Green Library as perhaps he could be. Um, he published almost 100 books, and I have 94 of them in the bookshop at the moment. But I, di I digress. It all began on the 27th day of the sale of the third Duke of Roxburgh's library, which fell on June 17, 1812. It was then that a landmark in sale room history was reached when a copy of the first edition of Boccaccio's Decameron, printed by Christopher Valdafer in Venice in 1471, sold for 2,260 pounds. The price was phenomenal, not merely because it was the highest price ever paid at auction for a printed book, and one not to be equaled for a further 60 years, but because it was so much in advance of any other book price hitherto known, almost five times the price paid in 1789 for a set of the Complutensian Polyglot Bible, the Jimenez Bible, as they call it. That made 483 pounds at the Pinelli sale. The record price derived directly from competition between the buyer, the Marquis of Blandford, and the underbidder, the second Earl Spencer. The bidding took place in a highly competitive atmosphere, which had developed through a number of sales during the early years of the century, and which was to continue in a less buoyant manner, manner for the next three years. The event was the climax of what was called bibliomania a term used pejoratively by its critics, but with enthusiasm by the book collectors of the day who saw much to admire in the willingness of men of means to spend three or even four figures on books. Foremost among such enthusiasts was the Reverend Thomas Frognall Dibden, 1776 to 1847. Interesting, 1847 is almost the date you, you could say Denise's book starts. That was the year Dibden died. Bibliomania was neither coined by Dibden as a term, nor was it his invention as a phenomenon. In 1751, Diderot in the Encyclopédie defined la bibliomanie as, forgive my French, un fureur d'avenir des livres et d'en ramasser, a, a fury to have books and to collect them. He was defining something known in France for at least the previous century. And in fact, the word bibliomania was first used in 1671. It was criticized both in France and England by La Bruyere, Evelyn, Addison, Chesterfield, Pope, and Diderot, amongst others. The earliest recorded use of the English form of the word bibliomania is in Hearn's diary on the 9th of November, 1734. And it is likely that there are unrecorded uses of this word which antedate it. The competitive book collecting practiced by aristocrats in the early 19th century was manifest a century earlier in the rivalry of the third Earl of Sunderland, 1674 to 1722, and Robert Harley, the first Earl of Oxford, 1661 to 1724. Throughout the 18th century, we find an increasing prominence among book buyers of wealthy merchants, well-beneficed clergymen, and successful physicians, such as Richard Mead and Anthony Askew, which is not to suggest that between the days of Harley and Spencer, the aristocracy were inert. John Carr, the third Duke of Roxburgh, had been dead eight years before his celebrated sale of 1812. He had been collecting for the greater part of his adult life. The second Earl Spencer was, ne was negotiating with Count Ravitsky for the purchase of the latter's library in the early 1780s. The library of the Earls of Leicester at Hookham 
was built up by several generations of the Cook family between 1712 and 1842. By the turn of the 18th century, book prices were taking a decidedly upward turn. Interest in English black letter texts is reflected in the price of 28 pounds brought by a copy of the first quartos of King Lear and the Merry Wives of Windsor at the sale in 1800 of the library of George Stevens, the Shakespearean critic. Dibdin may be just hazarding a guess when he tells us that some volumes, quote, cost Stevens not a 20th part of their produce. Nevertheless, his remark serves to underline the sharply increased demand for books of the 16th and 17th centuries in the age of Romanticism and Gothic revival. It was at the sale of John Brand, the Newcastle Antiquary, in 1807, that a Caxton imprint for the first time sold for more than 100 pounds. A fine copy of The Night of the Tour, 1483, sold for 11 pounds six shillings to Payne, the bookseller, who was bidding for Earl Spencer. Volumes are told in the history of book prices in the sale room fortunes of another Caxton, a Cicero of old age, 1481. At the sale of Anthony Askew in 1775, it was bought by Ralph Willett for 13 guineas. At his sale, December 1813, the Marquis of Blandford bought it for 210 pounds. At Blandford's disastrous sale of June 1819, it was bought by Robert Triphook, the London bookseller, for John Trotter Brockett, the Newcastle lawyer, for 87 pounds, three shillings. In Brockett's sale of March 1823, its price fell to the ignominious level of 47 pounds, five shillings. It appeared subsequently in the collection of James Orchard Halliwell Phillips, who sold it at a Sotheby's sale of 15th of December 1857 for 275 pounds, when the buyer was Henry Huth. At the Huth sale of June 1912, it sold for 1,000 pounds. Here we see not merely reflected the rise and fall of the early 19th century bibliomania, but the revival of book prices in the second half of the century, a trend accentuated by collectors in the United States, as Denise delineates so well in the book that we celebrate tonight. Comparable inflation is seen in the prices raised by continental incunabula, books printed before 1501. At the Heath sale of 1810, a first edition of Homer in Greek, printed in Florence in 1488, sold for 94 pounds 10 shillings. Mead's copy had sold 55 years earlier for 10 pounds. In part, this inflation resulted from isolation from the continent caused by the Napoleonic Wars. Good quality continental books, from incunabula to fine illustrated books of the 18th century, were in demand, and there was money to spend on them. Many of the great collectors were landowners whose fortunes were enhanced by the hugely inflated price of corn. John Carter opened his Sanders lectures in 1947. John Carter, I'm sorry, opened his Sanders lectures in, 18, in 1947 with a slightly qualified tribute to Dibdin, terming him, quote, the most enthusiastic and most prolific chronicler, anecdotist, and publicist in the history of bibliophily, who had lovingly celebrated the period of bibliomania in a series of ample and splendidly printed, though bibliographically not always <clears throat> reliable, volumes. Dibdin's originality lay in his attempt to make what he and his contemporaries termed bibliography as of appeal to a wider reading public than was usually commanded by the study of editions of books, their priority and degrees of rarity, which were some of the aspects of books subsumed under that then rather nebulous term. He saw, he Dibdin, saw his task in part as literary and not the mere provision of tools of reference, although many readers who today find the literary content of his books utterly negligible often consult them for the sale, for the sale room history that they contain or for the author's opinions on this printer or that edition. His enthusiasm for finely printed books is infectious because he conveyed in his writing what has been called 
a magical glamour which he and some of his contemporaries saw in the content and physical form of the well-printed and finely bound book. His own books often exhibit the skills of the greatest printers of his day. The bibliographical Decameron, uh, Three Vols, Large Quarto, 1817, a magnificent book, embodies the skills of some of the finest wood engravers of the day and the typography of William Bulmer at his best in the expression of much of interest on the history of the book and book collecting. Much more material concerning collectors and book trade practice is to be found in Dibdin's correspondence with contemporaries, such as Earl Spencer, Dawson Turner, the Yarmouth banker, author, and collector of autographs, John Bowyer Nichols, the proprietor and editor of the Gentleman's Magazine, William Roscoe, Francis Wrangham, Francis Deuce, Philip Bliss, and Isaac Disraeli, to name but a few. Interestingly, and the way that I met Denise was through a connection with William Blake. And Isaac Disraeli introduced Thomas Frognall Dibdin to William Blake, which, if you know anything about both of them, is a most unlikely conjunction. Blake bought A Songs of Innocence, A Book of Thel, Visions of the Daughters of Albion, and Young's Night Thoughts, almost certainly a colored copy, which Dibdin himself often referred to as his favorite book. Dibdin's determination to publish lavish books about books and book collecting had effects on his personal life which were utterly disastrous. I think some of us have been there. The last 30 years of his life were clouded by escalating debt incurred initially by the cost of the bibliographical Decameron and his bibliographical antiquarian and picturesque tour in France and Germany, published in 1821. By the mid-1820s, utilitarianism, manifest in several powerful Benthamite reviews, caused contumely to be heaped upon the, on the kind of collector who had formed the Roxburgh Club in 1812 and those who shared his tastes. On the publication of the Library Companion in 1824, Dibdin was viciously attacked in two reviews, the Quarterly and the Westminster. In the two decades which were to follow, Dibdin lost none of his lifelong urge to write about books. Little was published because the taste of the time leaned towards sterner and less mannered treatment of books and their contents. Other bibliographical tours similar to that which he made in France and Germany in 1819 were contemplated, but his account of only one, a bibliographical, antiquarian, and picturesque tour in the northern counties of England and Scotland, 1838, was completed and published. The shifts to which he was put following the sequestration of his two livings by his creditors were remarkable, as was the loyalty shown to him by such severely tried friends as Earl Spencer, Francis Deuce, and Dawson Turner. His enthusiasm for books never waned. It helped sustain him when pursued by creditors to the point of imprisonment for debt and is an endearing quality which brings us together tonight when we celebrate the end of Dibdin's life in 1847 and the beginning of Denise's book. Thank you. with uh, two wonderful talks and uh, a, a, a wonderful book. Um, that, that's been uh, a, a, such an extraordinary picture of, of the interplay of book dealers, biblio, bibliophiles, bibliomanias, uh, b uh, bibliomaniacs, uh, publishers, uh, the rich, the rich picture of of the book world of the United States uh, in in the in the nineteenth century. Uh, I, I thought at first I would talk a bit about uh, very briefly uh, about uh, book collecting. I don't really regard myself as a book collector. I think to be a, a serious book collector, you have to be much more 
systematic uh, that I am, and uh, it's more that I've acquired books uh, pursuing my various interests. But I ha do have, uh, there are four locations at Stanford where I have books. There used to be many of my books in the library, uh, in the se a, the w a room in the library. Uh, but now, uh, it's, uh, I hope you won't have to, the people here won't have to face this for some time, actually dispersing one's books is a, a, serious, a serious challenge. And in fact, if you swing by my house, I've placed uh, quite a few books on the porch which are, which are available for takeaway. Uh, but I think what's wonderful about this book is, is that it's uh, stim stimulated my interest in, in th uh, something I had not thought about before. Uh, there's some attention, some very interesting attention paid in the book to the libraries, college libraries, public libraries, uh, society libraries. And you realize that libraries, large collections of libraries, well, of course, there's the, the, the ancient libraries, but in, in the modern era, that, 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 that um, large libraries are comparatively, in some senses, new, uh, something new. And I'm sure there's studies of libraries and what I love about this book is that it led me to reflect personally on my, uh, my own relationship uh, with libraries. So if you'll forgive a few meandering remarks about libraries and me, uh, that's what I want to do uh, very briefly. And what also I think is very striking and perhaps not enough attention has been paid to is how extremely different various libraries are from one another. And if I may illustrate that by my own library story, uh, 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 perhaps, uh, I hope I won't be too meandering, and it may not be that interesting, but <laughs> at the moment you're a captive audience. Uh, 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 but from the age of one to nine, uh, I lived in Brooklyn, and a couple of blocks from the, from the just opened, rather magnificent Art Deco, uh, Brooklyn Ma Central Main Library, and it was wonderful. I mean, when I was old enough to read and go to the library, uh, it was incredibly important. And my chief memory uh, uh, reading there were reading the books, the Mary Poppins books and the Dr. Doolittle books. And I think that that must have been quite important in, in uh, somehow that years later, uh, my career would be devoted to British, uh, to British history. Uh, so there you have that striking Art Deco building. My next major, there was a new, when we moved to Manhattan, there was a very nice public library nearby. I don't remember, it was rather nondescript as, as a building. But then I guess the next library, which was, uh, which of course Mike would know extremely well, uh, was that extraordinary cathedral-like building, the Sterling Library uh, at, at, at Yale. And Yale's policy, which I'm thrilled that Stanford has, I don't think, a lot, some universities don't, but Yale, oh, I don't know if you had to get a special permission, but, but, but I don't remember, but, but Yale allowed uh, undergraduates uh, into the stacks. And, 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 and going into the stacks was absolutely fabulous. And, and as a part of my intellectual uh, uh, growth. And in fact, I was so addicted to going to the stacks, I once illegally uh, snuck into the stacks on the, a Sunday uh, when they were closed. A guard found me and he very gently kicked me out. Uh, he, uh, but, but, but the Yale Library 
was 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 uh, fabulous and and you know it was crucial in in uh, I was working on George Orwell, and and his essays had not been collected, and I, it was the fun of the chase uh, that that I had to track down various essays in their various pub periodicals, and that was great fun, in 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 the Yale Library. My next library experience uh, was I did a second BA at, at Cambridge. The Cambridge Library is, a, I think it's a rather boring uh, modern building. It doesn't have much character. But on the other hand, uh, at, at Cam of course there were college libraries and I'm delighted that Mike and I probably both used the, little, the very nice little library in the Pearson Tower, uh, Pearson College at Yale. Uh, but, but at Cambridge, of course, I was at King's, and King's had a the, nice library. And, and, and so the, your college library uh, tended to be more important uh, as, if you were doing an undergraduate degree uh, than the, uni the university library is fine, but there was something not, it, 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 architecturally, it's a tower, it's a nice building, uh, but it's certainly, it's certainly not, not anything great. And of course, the King's Library, uh, for my things I did subsequently, the King's Library in its archive has the most important collection of Bloomsbury material in the world. And, and also, I had the great pleasure uh, for four times uh, teaching one of those um, short f seminars overseas. Uh, to to Stanford uh, uh, Stanford students, and we had the extraordinary experience uh, twice. Uh, the class the classroom for that course uh, was in what had been George Dady or George Ryland's uh, set of rooms, and the actual classroom was was his dining room, where where Virginia Woolf uh, had. The glorious meal uh, that she writes about in *Room of One's Own*, which she contrasts to the dreary meal that she had at, at Newnham, Newnham College. But, uh, but, but also, of course, uh, not that I I did some research in it, but it wasn't significant. There is the magnificent. Uh, I'm mean, not significant in terms of my own personal experience. Um, there was the magnificent Wren Library at, at, at Trinity College. Uh, and of course, Virginia Woolf uh, made, made the great and legitimate complaint uh, that, that she wasn't allowed in it. Or maybe if a, man, if a fellow of the college took her in, she could go in. But, you know, uh, uh, but as a woman, she couldn't, she couldn't just uh, enter it, uh, and, which she talks about in room uh, a, a room of one's own. Um, and then, of course, and again, it's stylistically, it's, it's very different. I, uh, and to what degree does the nature of a building uh, determine what goes on in it? Um, my next major library uh, was, was the Widener Library at Harvard, which again, uh, had, well, as a graduate student, uh, I think undergraduate, I'm not sure whether Harvard allowed undergraduates in or not, but certainly obviously graduate students uh, could, uh, could be in the stacks. And the, the wonderful system they had, parallel to the offices that people have here, it, it wasn't a little office, but as a graduate student you could have a desk in the stacks and you, know, you could put books there. And, and so the Widener Library, well, obviously, it's one of the world's great libraries. There's no question about that. Uh, I, as a building, and uh, the great painter, he's a wonderful painter, but actually the war, First World War, World War I murals that John Singer Sargent did, which are on the great staircase, are actually not his best work. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, 
but you know the the, the library uh, it was 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 very uh, uh, very important, uh, and then of course um, I've I've spent uh, many years, many years, and and uh, in where we are, and and uh, this library uh, has been fantastically important. And of course, uh, I'm eternally grateful uh, to, to all the assistants, and I'm sure Denise has as well, uh, all the assistants, uh, guidance, help, receptiveness, uh, will you acquire this book? Uh, 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 the, the extraordinary support uh, that that I've I've received over the years uh, from from the Stanford Library, which I think is 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 quite successful uh, architecturally. I think I think uh, there's a certain pseudo ness in the Yale Library. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's a fake cathedral. It's it, I don't know. Most of you probably know it. You know, the main entrance is like a nave, and and. Uh, but it's a bit Yale pretentious in a sense, but at the same time, uh, it, it, and as I say, it, it, it was wonderfully, it treated its, uh, its undergraduates. Uh, there was a wonderful reading room parallel to the Bender Room. L and B, was it called? Uh, 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 that it was for casual reading. And, and um, it, it's a, it was a wonderful supportive, uh, supportive library. So uh, I, I, Denise's book is terrific in presenting you with, with this incredibly varied, lively, colorful uh, uh, an description and, and analysis of, and with wonderful ca colorful characters of, of the book world of, of, uh, of in America. And uh, it, it's uh, it led me to reflect on well, what can one say, how wonderful books are, and how delighted we are to be involved with them. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> we have a, a sort of 10 or 15 minute wrap up period before I can dismiss you to the food and the drinks. So uh, I just want to uh, respond very, very, very briefly in five minutes, <laughs> if possible, to, to the rich uh, talks that were given um, and then see if anybody else would like to raise any um, questions or comments. Uh, book related, biblio, okay? So I think I'll go backwards. Um, Peter was talking about the, the, it's not accidental, the relation between the contents of a library and its architectural ambitions. Um, the, you know, in mid 19th century America, the two basic types of libraries were on the one hand, private libraries which mainly middle class working people accumulated in order to perform research because there were not large libraries in this country at the time. If you wanted to be a historian, you needed to track down the books and materials that you needed. You needed to have uh, skills in bibliography. Um, so there were the private libraries on the one hand, and then there were public libraries which took a wide variety of forms. So there, were, there was the National Library in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., uh, which in 1846, an act of Congress gave a huge fund for the accumulation of a national collection, although at 60,000 volumes at mid-century, it could hardly compare to the British Museum, which had about 450,000 volumes, or the uh, National Library of France, which had in Paris alone, 825,000 volumes. So the scale here, the US really was in its infancy. Um, there were, uh, beyond at that level, going down from national, there were the state libraries, municipal libraries. 
um, town libraries, but the average number of books in those libraries at mid-century was about 7,000. They were very small. They were reading libraries. They give you access to Mary Poppins, right? <laughs> um, there were then the um, antiquarian and society libraries. There were Athenaeum and Lyceum libraries. There were joint stock libraries, like the Library Company of uh, Philadelphia, founded by Ben Franklin in 1731. And then perhaps most vivacious of all at this time, there were the university and college libraries. Um, these were on a very pathetic scale compared to Europe. So Yale, who we've all been boasting about, had about 20,000 volumes compared to 360,000 volumes um, in Göttingen, which is the university that, Har Har the Harvard College Library at mid-century was the largest in the country. It had 72,000 volumes. Um, so that scale is just really quite different. Uh, the other university libraries that could roughly hold a candle, John Carter Brown, at Brown University was collecting his library. It had about 24,000. Uh, Georgetown, same thing. And then again, Yale with 21,000. Nobody else came close to that. So, um, but, the, but the most vivacious of all, I think, were the mercantile apprentice and printer libraries. And these were libraries um, that operated at a very vigorous scale. They outsized university libraries. They outsized Lyceum library. Well. They were up there, <laughs> and they were growing. Um, and what they were were uh, libraries in which working people, working men, uh, could go after hours and improve their cultural knowledge and read and use the reading room and mix with other people, hear lectures on, on you know, the society of the Middle Ages, or uh, even take classes. The uh, Apprentice Library in Brooklyn uh, gave a wide variety of, of classes. So these were cultural institutions. And, the one th and then the public libraries, the first one uh, was New York and then Boston uh, on, on a major scale. The story of the development of the New York public libraries in my book, Boston very much was inspired by that and followed. But with united all of them, right? So not the, pro Gavin took the binaries out, I'm putting them back in. What united all of these public versions of libraries, even if they were subscription libraries, was that they had a public mission. They were democratic in their own ideology. They believed that they were making literature and culture available to the widest uh, number of people possible, and that they were uh, altruistic philanthropic institutions. Um, then moving to what John was talking about, uh, Thomas Frognall Dibden, to, to give you another binary. Um, Dibden was a Romantic era writer. He gave new life, he infused new life into bibliographical writing, uh, making it personal, making it lively, making it interesting, making it literary. Um, uh, it was very thick in content in terms of technique, but it wasn't what had been bibliographical writing earlier in the 18th century, which was, you know, information about typography, about engravings, about woodcuts, uncut copies, all the book fetishes of, you know, first editions, incunabula, etc. Um, that's that, that the, the, the hard and dry factual material of that was what bibliography meant really until Dibden. And then uh, there was Charles Lamb, William Hazlitt, and Lee Hunt, whose essays on bibliography really came to life in an utterly even new way, leaving out much of the technique. Although, you know, Hunt would write about book binding and typography, you know, with great relish. Uh, but they were the models for what is now considered uh, bibliog journalistic bibliographical writing. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, essayistic form. Uh, it's a very associative form. And it's very often a very pleasurable form to read. So that is a novelty, right, of that moment. And, and of course, my title comes from Dibden's Bibliomania, which was the book that gave popularized bibliomania. And lastly, um, Gavin's um, pointing out of the sentimental dimension of book collecting is really crucial. 
And I just wanted to underline that that is a category of value that was opposed to market value, right? So a book could be completely dilapidated and threadbare, uh, but, but its sentimental content, right, could make it, uh, you know, on the level of an icon, on the level of a relic, on the level of, you know, uh, the, the Waldorfer Decameron, um, which was a more expensive book. Market value often works against, as, as I'm sure Mike and, and Roberto and others can tell you, uh, uh, book value. So a mutilated copy of a book, right, which has been through an author's hands and has had things cut out or pasted into it, is worth less in terms of market value, but more, right, in terms of scholarly, is that right, Elaine? <laughs> She's giving me a strange look. Um, so, uh, so, so that, you know, really goes a long way toward explaining why it is that when I looked at all of these sale catalogs from the 19th century um, of these massive bibliomaniacal libraries that had accumulated by the end of the century, um, you know, they, they were more uh, publicity oriented and they gave kind of, you know, puffs on the front, unrivaled sale is what they usually said. Um, but no matter what was in those libraries, and very often there were extremely rare, expensive volumes, if any of Charles Lamb's books were among those thousands and thousands, it made it to the front cover, right? Which to me says more about the the value of sentimental community in America in the 19th century, right, than it does about anything else. So I hope that, so, okay. Uh, does it, would anybody like, yeah, Atta. Thanks, uh, giving us, um, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Denise, for, for writing this beautiful, which by the way, you write really beautifully. I've started reading it, and as I, as I was telling you, it reminded me of uh, bibliomaniacal character types of my own childhood. But I had uh, two questions. One is uh, the distinction between lending libraries, and I'm going back to library, lending libraries versus non-lending libraries. At what point did lending versus non? For example, Cambridge, Cambridge's library is a lending library. But the Bodleian is a non-lending library. So the experience of working in the Bodleian is completely different from the experience of working in, in a lending library. So my, my question has to do with lending versus non-lending. Then the second thing has to do with what, if any, did mass publication of, say, the paperback have, what impact did it have on bibliomania? Because much of what uh, has been described here assumes that the books were actually scarce. They were, they were rare books. Uh, they were hardbound, rare books, and so on. What, if any, effect did uh, mass produced, the mass production of books have on bibliomania? Okay. All right, so lending versus uh, non-lending library. So the non-lending library was known as a library of research and deposit. It was a collection that was intended for people to be able to access works that they wouldn't easily be able to access otherwise. Um, and the National Library in Washington, D.C., the Library of Congress was uh, exactly on the model of the British Museum, which was a library of um, research and deposit. You used the books in the reading room. Um, and then the uh, New York Public Library was based on the same model. Joseph uh, Green Cogswell, uh, who, who pulled together the Astor Library, which is at the basis of the New York Public, believed very much that the European model is something that should have been imported to America in order to improve the state of letters in the US at the time because there were plenty of places where you could get paperbacks. But a very serious library open to the public, even if the books did not circulate, and in his view, they should not circulate, so they would always be available for paging to whomever needed them, uh, was something, was the best way to genuinely raise the educational level and the quality of, of literary and cultural production in the United States. 
the Boston Public Library, founded on Cogswell's model, uh, went in the other direction. They had a little central center for research uh, where the books didn't circulate, but it was the first large, freely circulating um, library, public library. The Library Company of Philadelphia, the Athenaeums, you know, the Bo Boston Athenaeum, the Philadelphia Athenaeum, and these kinds of subscription libraries in which wealthy people, more or less, pooled their resources into a collection. Um, I mentioned that they also had a public mission. Um, those books could circulate to members. They could circulate to uh, a variety of people on a list, you know, if, if it was a, a, a divine or a, you know, a, a state officer or a college student they could borrow the books, families could borrow the books. Um, but anybody else who needed to borrow a book needed to just leave a deposit for the book and then take it away for a penny or two. And that was, that was uh, Franklin's model. So that's why he believed that the Library Company of Philadelphia was a public library, although book historians don't like to call it that. Um, because really you could come and use the reading room at certain hours and you could borrow books as long as you left a deposit. <clears throat> Peter. Uh, uh, I, I should have really, uh, just to make a very brief addendum to what I said, what I, what, what I forgot to mention and what just been said reminded me of that. The, the other two libraries uh, that I spent a great deal of time in uh, with the two two English libraries, not only the Cambridge one, and of course there's a wonderful con the the Bodleian um, in Oxford. Uh, you know, architecturally, is 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 quite extraordinary. And if you're working in manuscripts there, you work in the Duke Humphreys room, which which is you know from the original building, which is quite a, a, quite an experience. And, 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 but then also, it seems to me there's a quite the fascinating <coughs> contrast uh, in London, because when I began research, there was that extraordinary, the, the, you know, there's a history, uh, rather improbably in a way, the British Library for many, many years uh, was in the British Museum. And it had this extraordinary, uh, and, and, and Denise talks a bit about Panisi. It, 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 had, it had this extraordinary reading room. Uh, but again, of course, that, that was for books. And uh, most of the work I was doing there was in manuscripts, and they had a rather nondescript manuscript room. But nevertheless, the reading room was extraordinary. And then, of course, yeah. it moved. It's a satisfactory building. It has the great statue by, uh, of Newton outside of it, uh, a, a modern statue. The, uh, the present British Library, which of course many of you may know, uh, it's fine and it works very well. Oh, Peter, uh, but it's, I'm, uh, I'm going to cut you off right now. Yeah, it has I, less, I'll less forget than what I was about whatever. to say. Uh, I, would, I would also say that uh, one other critical difference in the nature of libraries uh, at, in the 19th century was that. Um, um, <clears throat> in the United States, <clears throat> when, when individuals started collecting massive collections that then became institutional libraries, there was an emphasis on and an interest in the rare book, in special collections. You would have rooms, you know, like the special collections of manuscripts of special... It was all to the reverse in Britain where rare books were shelved with regular books because the ideology dictated that you know, libraries, public libraries, were there to provide the archive of human knowledge. And they were there as texts. And to fetishize any particular book just showed the amateur quality of the person doing the research, right? Whereas uh, American, I mean, uh, American Bibliomania was an amateur um, endeavor, but in the, in the best possible way, right? Um, uh, so, it took a long time, not until the 1870s, did Britain start to pull aside its incunabula and, it, and its, you know, its rare books for preservation. But the moment that a rare book or, a, or an old book enters a special collection or an institutional library, 
it loses its life because its life largely is in its circulation and it develops and adds new associations as it moves through the world. So once it becomes locked into uh, a, an environment in which it's a, a museum-like environment and, and is preserved and maintained, it also is kind of in a sarcophagus of, of sorts in terms of its own life. So, uh, Mike, did you at, at that point want to? Yeah. So first of all, this has been rather extraordinary, and I'm delighted that you are all here, and I'm delighted with Risen and uh, Gavin. My mistake. I got your last name wrong. So a couple of stories. You all know about the Google Book Project, I think. What you don't know is that when the original five institutions agreed to uh, submit some of their books to that process of digitization. Stanford and Michigan agreed to do everything, but um, the Google guy, um, Larry Page, decided he wanted to take the money he was investing in that and give it over to other products like self-driving cars, and we never got to get all uh, 11 million of our volumes digitized. We only got to about three and a half million. million. Too bad. but. There was an examination done of all the books in all of the five libraries, which were Michigan, Stanford, New York Public Library, Harvard, and uh, what's the British one? It's not, not the British Library, it's Oxford. And there are various um, um, uh, filters that identified books that could be published, each filter provided by either law or the individual institution. But the examination of all the metadata, the catalog record, showed the following, and this is really, I think, quite exciting. 50% of the books were held commonly among all five, but 50% of all those titles were not. They were spread out among all the, other, all the five institutions, which showed, in my view, that these libraries had been collecting for and with the advice of their faculty and their students. And that's why these collections are so extraordinarily different, really and truly. I think that's a hypothesis I'd love to have somebody test, but it was, it was clear to me that that's the, one of the major, major factors. With regard to books in a sarcophagus, the, the reason we don't shelve rare books with the general collection books is that we wouldn't have any rare books left. <laughs> And they actually get lots of use, and we are frequently full. And we also digitize them and make them accessible in digital form, which for many purposes are perfectly OK. We digitize slowly and carefully, but we do do that. And many other of the great libraries do exactly that. Uh, I had a daughter who went to Wellesley College. She was enabled to become a member of the Athenaeum and thus to borrow books on the strength of a very small amount of money and uh, basically a signature. I think that's fabulous. And the Athenaeum in, in Boston is particularly wonderful. A uh, bunch of people and a great, a great collection. So um, just let me check my note here. Libraries of research and deposit. There's another value set that you all have to understand and it's something that I've been uh, operating on and insisting that my curators observe since I've been here in, since 93. And that is, what is the research value of an item or a collection? We have turned down collections, and you remember one of them, that you we were very angry with me about, because they had already, it had already been mined. There were already 27 or 28 monographs and an unbelievable number of articles that had already been uh, written. This was the William Morris collection. I got a grand talking to from my friend Peter here. <laughs> and the reason we didn't take it was that it had already been very well mined. There may be more books to be written from it, but the, the amount of money was so high, I felt it wasn't really a good investment. So the research value, the value of the estimated number of uh, monographs that would re result from a collection coming here, or an item coming here. I know. 
I know it. And, they, and a Huntington is a display library. That's a different thing than what we are. By and large, the Huntington has lots of wonderful books, lots of colorful books, lots of interesting books, but they are focused on, as they are in their whole program, with a kind of presentation mentality. We're much more gritty and workmanlike, and it's your book and your books and your work and so forth that make that true, and more to follow. So stay tuned. I've just received today a very interesting piece that we won't be able to show you, but we will be able to digitize and show you. That's an amazing piece of Americana, 19th century. It will be, un, it'll, it, it's gonna take a lot of effort to um, protect it. Uh, it's in very bad shape. And until we protect it, we can't digitize it. But when we do announce it, I know you're going to be very happy. Thank you all for coming.